Preface to Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Humorous Readings and Recitations, edited by Leopold Wagner. Preface by the Editor. In introducing to the public a third series of popular readings, I consider it merely necessary to state that the courtesy of authors and publishers has enabled me to bring together a choice selection of humorous pieces which have acquired a large share of popularity, in addition to a number of others that may justly be regarded as novelties. Concerning the former, I have so often had occasion to answer inquiries respecting particular pieces for recitation that it occurred to me the handy collection of those most generally sought after, but hitherto scattered through various publications, would be welcomed by many, and I took steps accordingly. How far I have succeeded in my purpose a glance at the contents list will show. For the fresh matter admitted to these pages, I sincerely trust that from among so many new candidates for popularity, at least one or two of them may be elected to represent the penny-reading constituents of each respective borough for some time to come. Once more I beg to express my indebtedness and thanks to those authors and publishers who have so generously placed their copyright pieces at my disposal. L. W. Brompton End of Preface Recording by Philip Gould Section 1 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Humorous Readings and Recitations, edited by Leopold Wagner, Section 1. Accompanied on the Flute, by F. Ancy. The Consul Duilius was entertaining Rome in triumph after his celebrated defeat of the Carthaginian fleet at Mylae. He had won a great naval victory for his country with the first fleet that it had ever possessed, which was naturally a gratifying reflection, and he would have been perfectly happy now if he had only been a little more comfortable. But he was standing in an extremely rickety chariot, which was crammed with his nearer relations and a few old friends, to whom he had been obliged to send tickets. At his back stood a slave who held a heavy Etruscan crown on the consul's head, and whenever he thought his master was growing conceited, threw in the reminder that he was only a man after all, a liberty which at any other time he might have had good reason to regret. Then the large Delphic wreath, which Duilius wore as well as the crown, had slipped down over one eye and was tickling his nose, while, as both his hands were occupied, one with a scepter, the other with a laurel bough, and he had to hold on tightly to the rail of the chariot whenever it jolted, there was nothing to do but suffer in silence. They had insisted, too, upon painting him a beautiful bright red all over, and though it made him look quite new and very shining and splendid, he had his doubts at times whether it was altogether becoming, and particularly whether he would ever be able to get it off again. But these were but trifles after all, and nothing compared with the honor and glory of it. Was not everybody straining to get a glimpse of him? Did not even the spotted and skittish horses which drew the chariot repeatedly turn round to gaze upon his vermilion features? As Duilius remarked this, he felt that he was indeed the central personage in all this magnificence, and that on the whole, he liked it. He could see the beaks of the ships he had captured bobbing up and down in the middle distance, and he could see the white bulls destined for sacrifice entering completely into the spirit of the thing and redeeming the procession from any monotony by occasionally bolting down a back street, or tossing on their gilded horns some of the flamens who were walking solemnly in front of them. He could hear, too, above five distinct brass bands the remarks of his friends as they predicted rain, or expressed a pain surprised at the smallness of the crowd and the absence of any genuine enthusiasm and he caught the general purport of the very offensive rivalry circulated at his own expense among the brave legions that brought up the rear. This was merely the usual course of things on such occasions, and a great compliment when properly understood, and Duilius felt it to be so. In spite of his friends, the red paint and the familiar slave, in spite of the extreme heat of the weather and his itching nose, he told himself that this, and this alone, was worth living for and it was a painful reflection to him that, after all, it would only last a day. 
he could not go on triumphing like this for the remainder of his natural life he would not be able to afford it on his moderate income and yet and yet existence would fall woefully flat after so much excitement it may be supposed that duilius was naturally fond of ostentation and notoriety but this was far from being the case on the contrary at ordinary times his disposition was retiring and almost shy but his sudden success had worked a temporary change in him and in the very flush of triumph he found himself sighing to think that in all human probability he would never go about with trumpeters and trophies with flute players and white oxen any more in his whole life and then he reached the portia triumphalis where the chief magistrates and the senate awaited them all seated upon spirited roman nosed chargers which showed a lively emotion at the approach of the procession and caused most of their riders to dismount with as much affectation of method and design as their dignity enjoined and the nature of the occasion permitted there duilius was presented with the freedom of the city and an address which last he put in his pocket as he explained to read at home and then an aedile informed him in a speech during which he twice lost his notes and had to be prompted by a lictor that the grateful republic taking into consideration the consul's distinguished services had resolved to disregard expense and on that auspicious day to give him whatever reward he might choose to demand in reason the aedile added cautiously as he quitted his saddle with an unexpectedness which scarcely seemed intentional duilius was naturally a little overwhelmed by such liberality and like every one else favored suddenly with such an opportunity was quite incapable of taking complete advantage of it for a time he really could not remember in his confusion anything he would care for at all and he thought it might look mean to ask for money at last he recalled his yearning for a perpetual triumph but his natural modesty made him moderate and he could not find courage to ask for more than a fraction of the glory that now attended him so not without some hesitation he replied that they were exceedingly kind and since they left it entirely to his discretion he would like if they had no objection he would like a flute player to attend him whenever he went out duilius very nearly asked for a white bull as well but on second thoughts he felt it might lead to inconvenience and there were many difficulties connected with the proper management of such an animal the consul from what he had seen that day felt that it would be imprudent to trust himself in front of the bull while if he walked behind he might be mistaken for a cattle driver which would be odious and so he gave up that idea and contented himself with a simple flute player the senate visibly relieved by so unassuming a request granted it with positive effusion duilius was invited to select his musician and chose the biggest after which the procession moved on through the arch and up the capitoline hill while the consul had time to remember things he would have liked even better than a flute player and to suspect dimly that he might have made rather an ass of himself that night duilius was entertained at a supper given at the public expense he went out with the proud resolve to show his sense of the compliment paid him by scaling the giddiest heights of intoxication the romans of that day only drank wine and water at their festivals but it is astonishing how inebriated a person of powerful will can become even on wine and water if only he gives his mind to it and duilius being a man of remarkable determination returned from that hospitable board particularly drunk the flute player saw him home however helped him to bed though he could not induce him to take off his sandals and lulled him to a heavy slumber by a selection from the popular airs of the time so that the consul although he awoke late next day with a bad headache and a perception of the vanity of most things still found reason to congratulate himself upon his forethought in securing so invaluable an attendant and planned rather hopefully sundry little ways of making him useful about the house as the subsequent history of this great naval commander is examined with the impartiality that becomes the historian it is impossible to be blind to the melancholy fact that in the first flush of his elation duilius behaved with an utter want of tact and taste that must have gone far to undermine his popularity and proved a source of much gratification to his friends he would use that flute player everywhere he overdid the thing altogether for example he used to go out to pay formal calls and leave the flute player in the hall tootling to such an extent that at last his acquaintances were forced in self-defense to deny themselves to him when he attended worship at the temples too he would bring the flute player with him on the flimsy pretexts that he could assist the choir during service 
and it was the same at the theatres where duilius such was his arrogance actually would not take a box unless the manager admitted the flute player to the orchestra and guaranteed him at least one solo between the acts and it was the consul's constant habit to strut about the forum with his musician executing marches behind him until the spectacle became so utterly ridiculous that even the romans of that age who were as free from the slightest taint of humor as a self-respecting nation can possibly be began to notice something peculiar but the day of retribution dawned at last duilius worked the flute so incessantly that the musician's stock of airs was very soon exhausted and then he was naturally obliged to blow them through once more the excellent consul had not a fine ear but even he began to hail the fiftieth repetition of pugnere nalumus for instance the great national peace anthem of the period with the feeling that he had heard the same tune at least twice before and preferred something slightly fresher while others had taken a much shorter time in arriving at the same conclusion the elder duilius the consul's father was perhaps the most annoyed by it he was a nice old man in his way the glass and china way but he was a typical old roman with a manly contempt for pomp vanity music and the fine arts generally so that his son's flute player performing all day in the courtyard drove the old gentleman nearly mad until he would rush to the windows and hurl the lighter articles of furniture at the head of the persistent musician who however after dodging them with dexterity affected to treat them as a recognition of his efforts and carried them away gratefully to sell duilius senior would have smashed the flute only it was never laid aside for a single instant even at meals he would have made the player drunk and incapable but he was a member of the manis spay and he would with cheerfulness have given him a heavy bribe to go away if the honest fellow had not proven absolutely incorruptible so he would only sit down and swear and then relieve his feelings by giving his son a severe thrashing with threats to sell him for whatever he might fetch for in the curious conditions of ancient roman society a father possessed both those rights however his offspring might have distinguished himself in public life naturally duilius did not like the idea of being put up to auction and he began to feel that it was slightly undignified for a roman general who had won a naval victory and been awarded a first-class triumph to be undergoing corporeal punishment daily at the hands of an unflinching parent and accordingly he determined to go and expostulate with his flute player he was beginning to find him a nuisance himself for all his old shy reserve and unwillingness to attract attention had returned to him he was fond of solitude and yet he could never be alone he was weary of doing everything to slow music like the bold bad man in a melodrama he could not even go across the street to purchase a postage stamp without the flute player coming stalking out after him playing away like a public fountain while owing to the well-known susceptibility of a rabble to the charm of music the disgusted consul had to take his walks abroad at the head of rome's choicest scum duilius with a lively recollection of these inconveniences would have spoken very seriously indeed to his musician but he shrank from hurting his feelings by plain truth he simply explained that he had not intended the other to accompany him always but only on special occasions and while professing the sincerest admiration for his musical proficiency he felt as he said unwilling to monopolize it and unable to enjoy it at the expense of a fellow-creature's rest and comfort perhaps he put the thing a little too delicately to secure the object he had in view for the musician although he was deeply touched by such unwanted consideration waved it aside with a graceful fervor which was quite irresistible he assured the consul that he was only too happy to have been selected to render his humble tribute to the naval genius of so great a commander he would not admit that his own rest and comfort were in the least affected by his exertions for being naturally fond of the flute he could he protested perform upon it continuously for whole days without fatigue and he concluded by pointing out very respectfully that for the consul to dispense even to a small extent with an honor decreed at his own particular request by the republic would have the appearance of ingratitude and expose him to the gravest suspicions after which he rendered the ancient love chant ludus idem ludus vedus with singular sweetness and expression duilius felt the force of his arguments republics are proverbially forgetful and he was aware that it might not be safe even for him to risk offending the senate 
so he had nothing to do but just go on and be followed about by the flute player and castigated by his parent in the old familiar way until he had very little self-respect left at last he found a distraction in his care-laden existence he fell deeply in love but even here a musical nemesis attended him to his infinite embarrassment in the person of his devoted follower sometimes duilius would manage to elude him and slip out unseen to some sylvan retreat where he had reason to hope for a meeting with the object of his adoration he generally found that in this expectation he had not deceived himself but always just as he had found courage to speak of the passion that consumed him a faint tune would strike his ear from afar and turning his head in a fury he would see his faithful flute-player striding over the fields in pursuit of him with unquenchable ardor he gave in at last and submitted to the necessity of speaking all his tender speeches through music claudia did not seem to mind it perhaps finding an additional romance in being wooed thus and duilius himself who was not eloquent found that the flute came in very well at awkward pauses in the conversation then they were married and as claudia played very nicely herself upon the tibiae she got up musical evenings when she played duets with the flute-player which duilius if he had only a little more taste for music might have enjoyed immensely as it was beginning to observe for the first time that the musician was far from uncomely he forbade the duets claudia wept and sulked and claudia's mother said that duilius was behaving like a brute and she was not to mind him but the harmony of their domestic life was broken until the poor consul was driven to take long country walks in sheer despair not because he was fond of walking for he hated it but simply to keep the flute-player out of mischief he was now debarred from all other society for his old friends had long since cut him dead whenever he chanced to meet them how could he expect people to stop and talk they asked indignantly when there was that confounded fellow blowing tunes down the backs of their necks all the time duilius had had enough of it himself and felt this so strongly that one day he took his flute-player a long walk through a lonely wood and choosing a moment when his companion had played in omnis faciunt till he was somewhat out of breath he turned on him suddenly when he left the lonely wood he was alone and near it something which looked as if it might once have been a musician the consul went home and sat there waiting for the deed to become generally known he waited with a certain uneasiness because it was impossible to tell how the senate might take the thing or the means by which their vengeance would declare itself and yet his uneasiness was counterbalanced by a delicious relief the state might disgrace banish put him to death even but he had got rid of slow music forever and as he thought of this the stately duilius would snap his fingers and dance with secret delight all disposition to dance however was forgotten upon the arrival of lictors bearing an official missive he looked at it for a long time before he dared to break the big seal and cut the cord which bound the tablets which might contain his doom he did it at last and smiled with relief as he began to read for the decree was courteously if not affectionately worded the senate considering or affecting to consider the disappearance of the flute-player a mere accident expressed their formal regret at the failure of the provision made in his honor then as he read on duilius dashed the tablets into small fragments and rolled on the ground and tore his hair and howled for the senatorial decree concluded by a declaration that in consideration of his brilliant exploits the state hereby placed at his disposal two more flute-players who it was confidently hoped would survive the wear and tear of their ministrations longer than the first duilius retired to his room and made his will taking care to have it properly signed and attested then he fastened himself in and when they broke down the door next day they found a lifeless corpse with a strange sickly smile upon its pale lips no one in rome quite made out the reason of this smile but it was generally thought to denote the gratification of the deceased at the idea of leaving his beloved ones in comfort if not in luxury for though the bulk of his fortune was left to carthaginian charities he had had the forethought to bequeath a flute-player apiece to his wife and mother-in-law end of section one Recording by Philip Gould
section two of humorous readings and recitations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b humorous readings and recitations edited by leopold wagner section two the troubles of a triplet w Beatty kingston i am i really think the most unlucky man on earth a triple sorrow haunts me and has done so from my birth my lot in life's a gloomy one i think you will agree tis bad enough to be a twin but i am one of three no sooner were we born than pa and ma the bounty claimed i scarce can bear to think they did it makes me feel ashamed they got it too within a week and spent it i'll be bound upon themselves at least i know i never had my pound our childhood's days in ignorance were lamentably spent although i think we more than paid the taxes and the rent for we were shown as marvels and unless i'm much deceived the smallest contributions were most thankfully received we grew up hale and hearty would we never had been born as like to one another as three peas or ears of corn between my brothers ichabod abimelech and me no difference existed which the human eye could see this likeness was the cause of dreadful suffering and pain to me in early life it nearly broke my heart in twain for while my conduct as a youth was fervently admired that of my fellow triplets left a deal to be desired i was amiable and pious too good deeds were my delight i practised all the virtues some by day and some by night whilst ichabod imbrued himself in crime and sad to say abimelech when quite a lad would rather swear than pray think of my horror and dismay when in the park at noon an obvious burglar greeted me with hello ike old coon he vanished suddenly my wrists were gripped by policeman x young man you are my prisoner on a charge of forging checks he ran me in and locked me up to moulder in a cell the reason why he used me thus alas i know too well he took me for abimelech my erring brother dear who was wanted by the bank of which he'd been the chief cashier next morn the magistrate remarked this is a sad mistake though natural enough i much regret it for your sake but if you will permit me to advise you i should say leave england for some other country very far away for if you go on living in this happy sea-girt isle although your conduct like my own be pure and free from guile your likeness to those sinful men your brothers twain will lead i fear to very serious inconveniences indeed i took the hint and sailed next day for distant o why he as might have been expected i was cast away at sea a pirate lugger picked me up and dreadful to relate abimelech her captain was and ichabod her mate i loved them and they tempted me to join them i agreed forsook the path of virtue and did many a ghastly deed for seven years i wallowed in my fellow-creature's gore and then gave up the business to settle down on shore my brothers on retiring from the buccaneering trade in which i'm bound to say colossal fortunes they had made renounced their wicked courses married young and lovely wives went to church three times on sundays and led sanctimonious lives as for me i somehow drifted into vileness past belief earned unsavoury distinction as a drunkard and a thief even in crime ill luck pursued me i became extremely poor and was finally compelled to beg my bread from door to door i'm deep down in the social scale no lower can i sink upon the whole experience induces me to think that virtue is not lucrative and honesty's all fudge for ichabod's a bishop and abimelech's a judge from punch by permission of the proprietors End of section two.
Section 3 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julian Haver. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 3. Slightly Deaf by Bracebridge Hemming. Mr. Lloyd was a retired shopkeeper residing at the lodge, Norwood. He had amassed a fortune of thirty thousand pounds in the grocery business, principally by sending his sugar and flowering his mustard and other little tricks of the trade. Yet he went to church every Sunday with a clear conscience. At the time I introduce him to you, he was a widower with one son, Joseph, aged eighteen. Joseph was a shy, party-faced youth who had the misfortune to be deaf. Slightly deaf, his father called him, but he grew worse instead of better and threatened to become as deaf as opposed to Robitaille and time. Of course, his infirmity stood in the way of his getting employment, for he was always making mistakes of a ludicrous and sometimes aggravating nature. Add to this that Joseph was very lean and his father very fat, and you will understand why people called them feast and famine or substance and shadow. One morning after breakfast, Mr. Lloyd, who had been looking over some paid bills, exclaimed, Jaw! Joseph was reading the paper and made no answer. Jaw! thundered his father. This time the glasses on the sideboard rang, and Joseph got up, walked to the window, and looked out. What are you doing? shouted Mr. Lloyd. I thought I heard the wind blow, replied Joseph. Well, I like that. It was I calling. You? Yes, sir. Joseph invariably grew very angry if he didn't hear anybody, for he was ashamed of his deafness. But he often fell into a brown study and was as deaf as an adder. Besides this, he was more deaf on one side than on the other, as is often the case, and he happened to have his very bad ear turned to his father. Why don't you speak out? said he. I did, replied Mr. Lloyd. You always mumble. I hallowed loud enough to wake the dead. You know I'm slightly deaf. Slightly. You'll have to buy an air trumpet. Trumpet be blowed, answered Joseph. Here, put these bills on the file, exclaimed Mr. Lloyd, pointing to the bundle. Joseph advanced to the table, took up the bills, and deliberately threw them into the fire, where they were soon blazing merrily. Mr. Lloyd uttered a cry of dismay, sprang up and ran to the grate, but he was too late to save them. "'You double-barreled idiot!' he cried. "'What's the fuss now?' asked Joseph calmly. He always was as cool as a cucumber, no matter what he did. "'You'll never be worth your salt.' "'What's my fault?' "'I said salt. Keep quiet and I'll get you some.' "'No!' roared Mr. Lloyd. "'Why did you say so for, then?' It seems to me you don't know your own mind two minutes together. Mr. Lloyd stamped his foot with impatience on the carpet. Oh, dear, what a trial you are! he exclaimed. They are receipted bills, and I told you to put them on the file. F-I-L-E, do you hear that? I hear it now, responded Joe. It's a pity you won't speak up. So I do. They'll never call you leather lungs. Oh, Joe, Joe, you'll be the death of me. You're a duffer, and it's no use saying you're not. I was going to tell you I'd got a berth for you, but I'm afraid you couldn't keep it. What is it? Clerk in the office of my old friend, Mr. Maybrick, the stockbroker. Ah, huh, said Joseph. What's a mock stoker? A stockbroker, shouted Mr. Lloyd. Why didn't you say so at first? Do you think I don't know what that is? I'm not quite such a fool as that comes to. You'd aggravate a saint, Joe. Paint your door. Have you gone mad? Great heavens, I shall hit you. Get out, shrieked his father. Got the gout. Oh, that's another thing. I thought you'd have it. You drink too much port after dinner. I say, jaw, cried Mr. Lloyd. Are you doing this on purpose? You don't understand a word I say. In fact, you misconstrue everything. If that is so, I can't help it. You're getting worse. Don't do that, replied Joe gravely. Hmm? Don't curse me. If I am deaf, that is to say slightly deaf, 
It is my misfortune, not my fault. You are to make allowance for me and speak louder. Do you want me to be a foghorn or a revisting tug? Certainly not. Or a cavalryman's trumpet? Or a bellwin bull? No, father. Or, continued Mr. Lloyd with rising temper, a spouting wail, an old bailey barrister, a town crier, a grumpus, a locomotive blowing off steam, an Australian bellbird or a laughing jackass. I'm sure I never laugh, so you needn't fling that at me. I wish you were dumb as well as deaf, groaned Mr. Lloyd. Why? Because I might then get you into the asylum. Phylum, muttered Joseph. He's still thinking of the bills. Confound him, muttered his father. He's worth in a county court judgment. I don't know what to do with him. To soothe his nerves, he lighted a cigar, and looking in the fire, puffed away at the weed, while Joe again took up the paper and went on reading. Half an hour passed. Then Mr. Lloyd said, You know you're getting worse, but you're so obstinate you won't admit it. And it's six to four, you'll not yield. Joseph looked up with irritating calmness. No, thanks, he exclaimed. What do you mean? I never bet. Who talked about betting? yelled his father. You offered six to four on the field, and I didn't ya. Never mind, I shan't take you, replied Joseph. Mr. Lloyd got up and did a war dance. Who asked you to? You did. It only won six weeks to the derby, and Mr. Lloyd lost all control over himself for the moment. He took up the coal scuttle and threw it at his son, which was a very reprehensible thing to do. But it didn't hurt Joseph, for that intelligent youth saw it coming, and ducking his head, it went with a crash through the window into the street. That's a clever thing to do said Joseph, without so much as winking. You needn't get mad, because I won't bet. His father shook his fist at him. You'll be my death, he replied, sinking into a chair with a gasp. I can't help it if I am deaf, rejoined the imperturbable Joseph. You're sharper than a serpent's tooth. It wasn't very sharp of you to break the window. Go to Putney. Where am I to get Putty? said Joseph. Send for a glazier. Bless us and save us groaned Mr. Lloyd. There isn't much saving in having a broken window to catch cold by. Mr. Lloyd rushed into the hall, and taking down his hat and coat from the rack, put them on. Come up to town at once, he exclaimed. We'll go and see Mr. Maybrick. What's the good of a hayrick? asked Joseph simply. Huh? You can't stop a hole in the window with a hayrick. I said Maybrick, the broker roared Mr. Lloyd, putting his hands to his mouth. "'I do wish you'd speak out. Get a trumpet, you!' "'Trumpet! We're not playing whist!' "'Oh, dear!' sighed Mr. Lloyd. "'He must be apprenticed to Maybrick. I'll pay a premium if it's a hundred pounds. I'm not a hog and don't want to enjoy this all by myself. I'll share it with another. It's too much for one to struggle with. I can't undertake the worry single-handed. It's too much.' He had to go close up to Joseph and bowl in his ear to make him understand what he wanted, for he had never found his son's deafness so bad as it was that day. Joseph was quite willing to go, and quitting the house, they took the train and went to town together. It was yet early in the day, and they reached the broker's office about twelve, finding him in at leisure. During the journey, Mr. Lloyd had impressed upon Joseph the necessity of keeping his ears open as well as he could for if he made any mistakes he would soon get chucked, as they say in the city, and Joe promised to be as wide awake as his infirmity would permit him. How wide awake this was, we shall see. Mr. Maybrick had done business with Mr. Lloyd for many years, and received him in his private office with all the cordiality of an old friend. "'Brought my boy to introduce to you,' exclaimed the retired grocer. "'Very glad to see the young gentleman,' replied Mr. Maybrick. Take a chair, have a cigar. Quite a tip of the old block, I see. What's his name? Joseph. Joe, for short. Very good. Now, what can I do for you? Are you going to open stock? Not today. Markets are very firm. I didn't come for that purpose, Maybrick. I want to get the youngster into your office. Oh, yes, answered the broker. I forgot. He spoke about it a little while ago. Last time I was up when I bought those Russians. Against my advice, and burnt your fingers over them. True. 
Well, I'll take him. One hundred pounds premium, no salary, first year, then seventy pounds, and an annual rise according to ability. That will do. I hope he's smart. Smart as a steel trap, though sometimes he's a little absent-minded, and you've got to speak loudly. Maybe more than once, but that's only now and again. I'll write you a track and leave him here, so that he'll know the ropes. Very well. I dare say we shall get on. I've ten clocks, and I've only changed once in ten years. That speaks well for you. I read character and I'm kind, said Mr. Maybrick. Sit at my table, you'll find pen and ink. While Mr. Lloyd was getting out his checkbook and writing the draft, Mr. Maybrick turned his attention to his new clerk. Have you ever been out before? he queried. Go out of the door, replied Joe. Yes, sir, if you want to say anything of a private nature, I'll go with pleasure. No, no, do you understand work? I beg your pardon, I shan't shirk anything. Bless me, cried the broker. I mean, do you know business? No business, answered Joseph with a solemn shake of the head. I'm sorry for that. Times are dull, though, all round. I've got plenty, you mistake me. Don't run away with that idea. You won't find this an easy place. Got a crazy face, have I? responded Joseph. It's not very polite of you to tell me that. What the began Mr. Maybrick when Joe's father handed him the cheque. There's the nitful, exclaimed Mr. Lloyd. Thanks, replied the brocading. I say, old friend, isn't Master Joseph a little hard of hearing? Oh, um, not that exactly. What then? He's got a cold in his head. Is that all? Yes, uh, he got his fees wet, said Mr. Lloyd confidentially, and I had to bawl at him this morning. I thought he was uh, <clears throat> a little deaf. Bless you, no. Raise your voice, that's all you've got to do. Ah, I see. It's better be like that, answered Mr. Maybrick, whose doubts were removed. The weather's been so bad everyone has had cold more or less. Telling the intelligent Joseph that he should expect him home to dinner at seven, Mr. Lloyd took leave of the broker, who gave his new clerk some accounts to enter in a book, saying that he might sit in his office for the remainder of the day and he would find him desk room on the morrow, after which he hurried away to see what was going on in the general room. Joseph hung up his hat and coat and set to work. He certainly meant to do his best. They say a certain place, which the Hebrews call Sheol, is paved with good intentions. Anyhow, the fates were against him. Never before had his deafness been so bad. It seemed to have swooped down upon and swamped him all at once. Scarcely had he begun his work than he was startled by the ringing of a bell. It was just over his head and proceeded from the telephone. Now Joseph knew just as much about a telephone as he did about the phonograph or the dot-and-dash system of telegraphy. He sprang from his chair, turned ghastly pale, and fancied it was an alarm of fire. What should he do? For fully a minute he stood gazing vacantly at the box and the bell. Then it rang again. Joseph jumped half a foot in the air. Then he rushed into the general room, where he found Mr. Maybrick talking to a client. Please, sir, can I disturb you for a moment? He said. I'm very particularly engaged, Lloyd, replied the broker. Excuse me, but what is it? There's a bell ringing. Oh, the telephone. I forgot to tell you to attend to it. It's run twice. Then somebody's in a hurry. Answer and come and tell me what it is. How do you do it, sir? Speak through the instrument, ask who it is and what he wants, and put the tube to your ear. The fright had somewhat stimulated Joseph's powers of hearing, for he caught these instructions and hastened back to the inn office. After a little experimenting, he put himself in communication, and the following colloquy ensued. Who is it? asked Joe. Oliphant, was the reply. Elephant, mused Joe. That's funny. But he went at it again. What do you want? By one o'clock, sell ten thousand max rails. Joe heard this order imperfectly. Buy ten thousand ox tails, he said to himself. This is a queer business. Yet he wasn't discouraged. Joe hadn't come into the city for nothing. He meant to do his duty or perish in the attempt. Right, he answered. Is that all? Yes, I'll call after lunch for the contract note. Very well, sir. 
having received his instructions, Joe, very proud of his success in manipulating such a peculiar instrument as the telephone, sought his employer. "'Well, Lloyd,' exclaimed the gentleman. "'It's all right, sir,' replied Joe. "'What is?' "'The elephant wants you to buy him ten thousand ox-tails.' Mr. Maybrick elevated his eyebrows. "'Who did you say?' he demanded in a loud voice. "'The elephant.' "'Mr. Oliphant, I suppose you mean. "'Ah, it might have been Oliphant. "'Or oh, Oliphant. "'It was something like that. "'Oxtails. "'Why not Max Rails? "'Mexican Railways, you know.' "'Hm,' said Joe. "'Very likely. "'Are you sure he said bye? "'Oh, yes, sir. "'That was distinct enough. "'And he said he'd come after lunch for the distracting note. "'Contract note. "'It may be that. "'The gentleman didn't speak very distinctly.' Oliphant has a low voice, said Mr. Maybrick thoughtfully. But he's one of my best customers. Perhaps he's heard something. He must have got some information. I'll have a bit in this myself. Oliphant is a very shrewd and careful speculator. That will do, Lloyd. Joseph departed, highly delighted. <laughs> Laughed Mr. Maybrick when Joe had gone. A new clock is an odd one. Buy ten thousand ox tails for the elephant. That's good. I must tell that story in the house. He beckoned to his manager, who was a man named Mappin, and told him to buy the required quantity of Mexican railway stock. Market's very weak, sir. It's fallen today one half already in anticipation of a bad dividend, replied Mappin. Can't help that. Mappin went away to execute the order. An hour elapsed, and a special edition of an evening paper was brought into the office. It contained a telegram from Mexico, stating that there hadn't been one revolution and two earthquakes in that country before breakfast, as usual that morning. The railway dividend was remarkably good, and Mexican preference stock went up 5%, at which price the broker took upon himself to close the account, thinking his client would be well satisfied with his profits. "'Clever fellow, Oliphant, muttered Mr. Maybrick. "'Up to every move on the board!' Deuced clever. At that moment, Mr. Oliphant, who was a stout, red-faced man, inclined to apoplexy, rushed into the office. He was agitated, and looked as if he was going to have a fit. Close the account, he gasped. I have done so, was the reply. What's it? A rise of five per cent. It will ruin me, groaned Mr. Oliphant. How you telephoned me to buy? I said so. Then my clock made a mistake, exclaimed Mr. Maybrick. But it's a lucky mistake for both you and I, for I followed your lead. You're joking. Never was more serious in my life. I'll give you a check at once. Mr. Oliphant's face brightened. And I'll give your wooden-headed clerk a ten-pound note, he said. That may console him for his dismissal, said Maybrick dryly. Are you going to get rid of him? Most decidedly, I cannot afford to keep a clock who makes errors of that kind. This time it has come out all right. Next time it may be all wrong. Just so, replied Mr. Oliphant. He handed Maybrick the ten pounds which the broker gave to Mappin, telling him to present it to Joseph, and inform him that his services would not be any longer required, and the premium his father had paid should be returned by post. Then the broker gave Mr. Oliphant his unexpected profits, and they went out to have a bottle of champagne together. Mappin saw Joseph. "'What are you doing?' he asked. "'Doing sums,' replied Joe, which was his idea of bookkeeping. "'Well, you needn't do any more.' "'No, I don't think it a bore,' said Joe. "'It's all in the day's work, don't you know? "'You're not wanted here.' "'Can't I hear? What do you know about it?' "'The fool's deaf,' cried Mappin, raising his voice. "'Take this tanner and go!' Joe heard this plain enough. Sacked, he said laconically. Yes, replied Mappin, nodding his head vigorously. What for? Playing the fool with the telephone. We've no use for you. Oh, very well. I thought I shouldn't answer. You see, we don't run our business on the silent system. Joe put on his hat and coat with that perfect unconcern which always distinguished him. Good morning, he said, pocketing the note. I say... I don't think much of the telephones, do you? Yes, it's a very clever invention. Ah, uh, there is no accounting for taste. 
With these words, Joseph quitted the office and took a walk in the city. End of section 3「Section 4 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 4 by the Lady Freemason by H. T. Craven Vainly we seek it, Sanskrit or Greek writ, in history the mystery of Solomon's secret. The dark queen of Sheba perhaps tried to get hold of it, but didn't, at least if she did, were not told of it. If Mabel of Lodge Number One lets it slip, his brother O'Cain of Lodge Two gives the grip. Allegarot, they say, be that as it may. The Cowan is somewhat put out of the way. So now if you fear for my prudence, dispel it. First place, I don't know. Next, I don't mean to tell it. But praise a shrewd guess if you think I deserve it. The cream of the secret is... How to preserve it a sworn brother mason who'd ever disseminate his knowledge or blab would be worse than effeminate on feminine weakness though let me be resent remembering the tale of the famous miss betty saint ledger whose name sheds a permanent grace on 150 the lodge of the lady freemason my lord donorail ne'er known to fail in duties masonic held land in entail with mansion near dublin of such wide dimension that freemason's lodge of no little pretension was warranted chartered and duly appointed and worshipful ruler my lord was anointed no master twas said ever laid down the law so no masons kept secrets so sacred or swore so none drilled and so skilled were in separate degree by the p m presiding of course my lord d in beggar's description you fail to appreciate the hubbub within when they met to initiate such tiling and tapping such knocking and rapping such shrieks and such squeaks such clapping and slapping such mauling and hauling and tearing and swearing such whispering of secrets and tell if you're daring such groans and such yells and such roast goosey smells when the poker was used like the scene in the bells you doubtless have thought so appalling enerving you think twas some madman who thought himself irving the cauterization on good information amounted i say to a partial cremation and sore on the subject were all aaron's gay sons next day when the boys gave em sauce for fried masons be it known that miss betty was donerail's daughter and one richard aldworth aspired to court her yet made his advances with progress so scanty he really remained much in status quo ante his motto was spiro but hope was at zero in the lady's eye dick didn't pose as a hero when her father lord donorail asked of him whether he joined the f m s he had shown the white feather whereat the proud beauty declared that no other should er be her slave than a man and a brother so dick having dined and not quite compost mentis agreed to go in for an entered apprentice the eve had arrived and the hall so baronial 
was decked in due form for the night ceremonial miss betty in passing downstairs chanced to see though the chub had been locked they had left in the key of a small ante-room of some minor utility but prized by the lodge for its accessibility miss said to herself though i fear the attempt i should like to see what a lodge is like empty oh daughters of eve there are some who believe your tongues are your weakness your failing verbosity while others contend you never amend of that fault mrs bluebeard possessed curiosity now i thought i'd fain dub such slanders as petty own they do say as much of dear charming miss betty though found to be equal to hold tongue or speak well with other good masons but wait for the sequel in through this outer door closing it warily out through an inner door softly and fairly she's there in the lodge where wax tapers are blazing all deftly arranged with precision amazing in the east for the worshipful boss is a throne in the west senior warden the places all shown no doubt to prevent any squabbles or wrangles initialed on chairbacks in gilded triangles on a table deep mysteries we must not unravel the mallet the plum and the gauge and the gavel other engines whose users we fear to unriddle the thumbscrew the pincers a poker a griddle with tapers and papers and paraphernalia blue ribbons and jewels and things called regalia the silence and solitude there were delicious and any one caring to feel superstitious might fancy the ghosts of freemasons translated to lodges above or below reinstated arrayed in their mouldy old aprons each brother past master who'd pass from this world to another but horrors of horrors whilst here she was musing came footsteps without and oh sound most confusing she heard the key turned that same key that beguiled in the first mentioned door now twas locked and fast tiled she rushed to the ante-room wild to get back but this cooled her courage twas now called a sack and hark in the lodge to augment her disaster the masons assembling escorting the master to hide while she thought how to scape from mishap she closed the other door of this snug little trap that door has a crevice and thereby new woes arise to secrets forbidden in vain tis to close her eyes how can she but note the masonic particulars with no cotton wool to cram in her articulars she heard her dad ask most distinctly and trembled at dogberry's words are we here all dissembled then commenced ceremonials misty and mystical questions and answers in form catechistical my lord in a tone both emphatic and sonorous impressing on each that his duties were onerous one duty to betty seemed highly improper twas kill without questioning any eavesdropper when the master was sudden and well feigned dismay for he very well knew that he'd got it to say cried hark there's a danger i feel that a stranger who's seeking for knowledge is coming this way each took up a napkin and end dipped in water and cried porcitorius give him no quarter while outside the door sundry knocks loud and clamorous as vulcan might deal when in humor sledge hammerous were echoed within by three knocks just the same with the pertinent query how now what's your game and a chap disabelle in great perturbation is run in very much like a prig to a station 
disguised as he was through the apropos hole the lady identified all worse red poll and thought well i wish you poor fellow good luck or more to the purpose i wish you good pluck for her father was urging in solemn oration you need my young friend for your fearful probation endurance true courage and strong veneration we commence with don't grin sir a pleasant frivolity just give of endurance a taste of your quality tis nothing a toweling brothers prepare then each had a flick at dick's legs which were bare he danced and he pranced at each cut of the towel and prod from the rear with the sharp pointed trowel and looked as he capered in lily white kilt the ghost of a highlander dancing a lilt to scotch eyes however the steps might seem clever dick showed less a hero in betty's than ever and shocked when he cried cutting up rather rough the long stroke your optics hold hard that's enough enough said the worshipful yes of this fun stern proof of your courage has not yet begun die here sir those knocks brothers let in the stoker and form a procession to bring in the poker see the surgeon is ready to make all secure with lancet and tourniquet bandage and ligature but why freeze your marrow your feelings why harrow your hearts are too soft and our space is too narrow to tell all the horrors twould fill you with awe to listen to half that elizabeth saw let us come back to dick's howl such a howl which as soon as she heard it miss betty fell down in a swoon all in a lump with a bump and a thump that made all the brothers to gape and to jump and turn pale and cry begad there's a spy shut up that closet and there he shall die to rush to the chamber to find what was in it and seize the eavesdropper was the work of a minute to lift up and shake her to rouse up and wake her to consciousness then in the lodge room to take her was work for six brothers who cried as they brought her we sought her and caught her my lord cried my daughter and sunk down is needing in self a supporter in rushed the tyler's crusty old filers with anger a-busting their blessed old bilers looking so grim at her one raised his cimeter and to very short shift was advancing to limit her as hold cried my lord hear your master or rather i speak to you all as her judge not her father perchance she knows nothing and if she will swear it her life shall be spared i your master will spare it oh tell me my child what you've seen what you've heard the truthful girl sobbed every act every word alas faltered he you have sealed your own doom and down with the spy cried each one in the room one raised a dagger some shouted scrag her some raised a trap-door and rushed forward to drag her when a voice like thunderclap topped all the rest and dick semi-dressed presented his breast before her strike here was his manly request strike me if you dare by jingo i swear of her you shall touch not so much as a hair i mean my good sirs whatever occurs to your lives or mine you shall not take hers her white arm how dare you place finger or fist on and dick shooting out his own arm like a piston knock over a senior warden who held her sent spinning a middle-aged junior his elder hit out a tyler a blatant reviler mashed the mug of a masher called tim the beguiler look out cried another the saxon's a bruiser 
and straightway got on his conk a confuser a dozen unitedly shouted excitedly fell him or else this young fellow will wallop us tell him or else this young fellow will wallop us down went two deacons not very weak ones and a blow on the nose of the third burst a polyps when the hero dick now at the title arrives denied him before he had handled his fives so many bawling reeling and sprawling for each brother knocked down another in falling had fluttered the voices from east to the west he paused like a warrior taking his rest or spartan who caused lots of persians to topple he took breath as he did a place called thermopylae now outspoke my lord in a masterful way a truce and a parley i've something to say tis writ in our laws if an eavesdropper pries and flitches our secrets he mark the he dies now this is a she therefore not an eavesdropper to kill her i say would be highly improper unless she objects to do as directs the master c'est moi now mark what i say next let's make her a mason and put a good face on the matter believing she'll prove not a base on i'll take on myself ending doubt and confusion to write to great queen street and get absolution then up take the stoker a regular croaker i'd like to know how you'll get over the poker long ago said my lord the precise anis mundi i can't call to mind regno coli jacundi a monarch whose province was pipo cum fidlum a part of the region of great carididulum sundry by-laws were passed for emergencies various whereby the submission to brand it is vicarious will some volunteer her substitute here submit to this crucial test tis severe dick on now spake and to the stake i'll go like a martyr as proxy to take all over again for the dear lady's sake that is here he tenderly glanced she approving i do said the maiden in accent quite loving agreed shouted all who'd been punched be it so glad no doubt of the chance to give dick quid pro quo the lady withdrew in well-guarded condition the decks quickly cleared for the second edition of flicks and of kicks pinching and licks twinging and singeing but murmur of dick's none heard in a word he was truly heroic and went through all with a smile like a stoic and when he so rumpled from processes recent retired to make himself decently decent miss st ledger returned resolution her face on took the oath and was entered a prenticed freemason moral when you meet with a mason just mention this lass i warrant she'll prove an excuse for a glass if he's a true brother the toast is a favorite he's good for a bottle but mind you don't pay for it you've but to edge her name in and pledge her the lady freemason miss betty st ledger end of section four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section five of humorous readings and recitations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Humorous Readings and Recitations Edited by Leopold Wagner Section 5 
what happened last night from the french of monsieur charles moncelet by f b harrison i cannot deceive myself i was horribly tipsy last night let him who has never been in the like case throw the first empty bottle at me how did it happen in this way i a civilian reading law was invited to dine at the garrison mess i had never been at a similar entertainment and i cannot but think now that i look back on it that the officers played some trick on me i only knew that they were prodigiously polite which always looked suspicious from a certain point from the third course i remember very little a sort of cloudy curtain intercepts the view like the curtains that come down in a pantomime and i do not know whether i was a clown a pantaloon or columbine yet something must have happened to me a great many things i've been sleeping in my white tie and then my face what a shockingly yellow dissipated face upon my word it is a pretty affair at my time one and twenty to be overcome by wine like a schoolboy out for a holiday i cannot express what i think of it how am i to know what happened last night ask my landlady no i cannot let her see how ashamed i am besides she would only know the condition in which i came home and that i can guess they say that from a single bone professor owen can reconstruct an entire antediluvian animal i must try and do something similar to reconstruct my existence during the last twelve or fourteen hours i must get hold of two or three clues where can i find them in my pocket perhaps since i was a small boy i have always had the habit of stuffing them with all manner of things now this is the time for me to search them i tremble what shall i find searches his waistcoat pocket i have gently insinuated two fingers into my waistcoat pocket and have brought out my purse empty hang it lifts his overcoat from the floor on picking up my overcoat i have found my pocketbook half open and the papers fallen from it on the carpet the first of these papers which catches my eye is the cart of last night's dinner well who was there how many of us several of the fellows i knew of course but which of them happy thought the menu will remind me of their various tastes and reveal their names to me oysters well i know that the colonel is a tremendous hand at oysters so i am sure he was there molitiganawi that is captain simpkins soup or rather liquid fire so simpkins was there two of them roast beef makes me think of little dumb kirk the jersey man who wants to be a thorough englishman he was there saddle of mutton tom horsley the invertate steeple chaser charlotte roos that is ned walker who published his travels from peterborough to petersburg now i know pretty well who some of my fellow guests were as for the others picks up some photographs hello there were women at the mess no certainly not then we must have talked of women and the men must have given me photographs of their female relatives strange thing to do especially as i don't know the ladies here's an ancient and fish-like personage in a blue jersey dumkirk's grandmother i'll be bound here a stout middle-aged dame widow probably i knew simpkins wants to marry a widow but why give me her portrait and this this is charming quite in the modern style low forehead small nose tiny mouth all eyes and what splendid eyes and such lashes she is fair as well as one can judge from a photograph 
and the little curls on her forehead are like rings of gold and so young a mere child a lovely figure our forefathers would have compared her to a rose tree but then our forefathers were not strong in similes she has neither earrings nor necklace perhaps that gives her that look of disdain disdain she knows nothing yet of life but tries to seem tired of it they are all like that who is she she must be the colonel's daughter i've heard that his daughter is a pretty girl i must have expressed my warm admiration of the photograph and he must have responded by giving it to me did i ask him for her hand did he refuse it or did he put off his reply perhaps that was why i drank too much now let me proceed what further happened let me continue my researches tries the pocket of his overcoat by jingo two visiting cards the first says captain wellington spearman first royal lancer dragoons the other major garnett bablock cannon rifle artillery now what does it all mean i do not know those military gentlemen they must have been guests like myself how do i come to have their cards there must have been some dispute some quarrel some row these two cards must have been given in exchange for two of mine it all comes back to me a duel perhaps two duels but duels about what whom did i affront i know i'm an awful fire-eater when i've drank too much but was i the challenger or the challenged i think my left cheek is rather swollen as if from a blow but that is mere fancy what dreadful follies have i got myself into i can make out some pencil marks on the first card that of the captain in the lancer dragoons yes ten o'clock behind st martin's church ah a hostile meeting that is clear i must run perhaps i shall be in time no too late it is half past eleven i am dishonored branded as a coward no one will believe me when i say that i had a headache and overslept myself on the morning of a duel i have no energy to look further in my pocket still one never knows brings out a handkerchief a handkerchief a very fine one think cambric but it is not one of mine there is a cornet in the corner how did i come by this handkerchief could i have stolen it i seem to be on the road to the county gale oh how my head aches a flower is in my buttonhole how did it come there forget-me-nots their blue eyes closed all withered and drooping i could not have bought so humble a bouquet at the flower shop it must have been given to me it was given me it came to me from the fair one with golden curls her father gave it to me from her knowing that i was about to risk my life to risk my life for her sake no doubt yes that is it my fears increase i dread to know more i am afraid to prosecute my researches in my pockets i may find my hands full of forget-me-nots or of blood oh ah by jove what now this overcoat is not mine no mine is dark grey this is light grey i have not travelled through my pockets but through the pockets of somebody else but then if the coat is not mine neither is the duel not mine the cart not mine the photographs not mine the forget-me-nots not mine the cards i have not stolen the handkerchief i am all right thank goodness i am all right and my romance about the colonel's lovely daughter i am sorry about it upon my word at least i am sorry for her for i fear now she will never make my acquaintance end of section five recording 
by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number six of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Humorous Readings and Recitations, edited by Leopold Wagner. Section six. Fatal Legs by Walter Brown I am an actor, or rather, I call myself one. I am, however, disengaged, the more so since Widow Walker has. But let me not anticipate, which, by the by, I never could have done, no matter. I took apartments, comfortably furnished, with a widow lady named Walker. I was first floor back, and first floor front was Mr. Simon Simpkin of the theatre. The widow always calls us first floors, either back or front, and never by our names, although we never call her out of hers. If we had, she would not have come. She was an obstinate woman, but at times she got confused. She always called me in the morning, and once she called me front and then went to Simpkin with my shaving water. When I called her back, she called me something else, and threw the pitcher at me. I was in hot water for a while. The widow walker was fair, fat, and forty, that is, rather fair, extremely fat, and very forty. She might be more, at any rate her voice was forte too. The actor, Simpkin, was fragile and long, he played heavy parts, which possibly was the cause of his constant complaint that he had not got his share of fat. Although lengthy, he was even less in his various diameters than I was. Still I longed for his length. And why? The widow walker wallowed in wealth untold, and I could see she smiled upon the suit of Simon Simpton. Well, she might. It was second-hand. He, too, was a widower, or rather, he would have been if his wife had lived. I mean, if she had lived to be his wife. But she didn't. She died before the fatal knot was tied. In fact, it was not tied at all. No matter, he had loved before, while my suit was brand new. I determined to try it on. I longed to win the widow for my wife. I should say for myself. One day I saw the actor kiss her through the keyhole. We were rivals from that moment. At least I was. He didn't see me, or he would have been one too. I mean one also. That is to say there would have been two of us, whereas there was only one of me. No matter. The widow went a good deal to the theatre. She ordered him and he gave her orders, that is, passes for two. He knew her size. She always took twos in seats. He did the villains at the theatre, while I did the hero at home. He bellowed in blank verse, while I blew the kitchen fire with the bellows. He mashed her, while I mashed the potatoes for supper. But I determined to beard the clean-shaven lion in his lair. In short, or rather at length, I obtained an engagement, and became an actor. My rival and myself now stood on the same footing. I mean we should have done only, in a word, we didn't. Simon Simpkin, as before observed, indeed observed anyhow, was slender as a willow wand, and appropriately pliable, especially about the legs. Still, on the stage, his nether limbs looked round and well proportioned. His calves might pass for cows, and his knees were second elbows, or rather, elbows. They held a bony part in exile. On the other hand, I should say legs. My tights were always loose, and while the widow smiled on his understanding, 
she smiled at mine i thirsted for my hated rival's blood or rather for his flesh more correctly speaking for the shape of his legs technically for his leg shapes having failed in an attempt to have his blood by means of a darning needle i determined to go for his shapes i went for them one night before the performance i went to his dressing-room and got them that night the widow walker was in front i was desperate i was determined that she should see her simkin in all his naked i should say his unpadded deformity and that mine that is my limbs should be replacent in his borrowed plumes but alas all my plans and myself were violently overthrown by simkin i had merely insinuated one leg in the woolly pads when he insinuated another somewhere else we argued the manner all over my dressing-room meanwhile time jogged merrily along the curtain was raised and so were we eventually but unfortunately i had only retained one half of those precious pads the right was on my left leg but simkin had carried off the left leg all right what was i to do my left leg would not look right or if it did my right leg would be wrong there was no time however for consideration as my face required sponging before applying the sticking plaster and eventually i had to hobble on to the stage with two odd understandings that is one odd one and one even one even that was odd which appears odd no matter fortunately i went on from the o p side which enabled me to put my best leg foremost in the centre of the stage i met simkin who had entered from the prompt side the widow gazed with rapture on us both until oh horror after a short scene it was necessary that each of us should retire to the place from whence we came we advanced towards it backwards and mutually stumbling our other legs became exposed to view a yell from the audience the sack from the management and a week's notice from the widow subsequently greeted us besides which simkin and myself are not on the best of terms we get into argument when we meet in the streets i stay home a good deal now end of section six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 7 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 7. The Caliph's Jester On a moosent of state was reclining the Caliph, the mighty Heron. His brow like the sun it was shining, his face it was like the full moon. And his courtiers around him were standing, like stars in an indigo sky. And the saki the wine cup was handing, for the monarch through Pius was dry and the poets their works were reciting in arabic numbers divine the hearts of all hearers were delighting with verses like adolf's or mine then the caliph glared round the assembly as a lion glares round on the herd and the knees of the courtiers grew trembly and their hearts fluttered and as a bird and cold drops were distilled from each forehead and each tongue to its palate did cling for their fear of their caliph was horrid he was such a passionate king at length in a voice that with passion was shaking it pleased him to speak 
does he know whom he treats in this fashion did you e'er behold aught like his cheek this poet this gesture this chauffeur this pig son this bullock this ass this black-hearted black-visaged kaffir this infidel obu nuwas i bade him come hither to meet us in this serious council of state and in this the way he dares treat us ye dogs he is five minutes late then the heart of his highness relented rashid was of changeable mood maybe he's been somehow prevented to get in a rage does no good his jests too are always so pleasant on somehow his impudence stands besides poor Mesur just at present has plenty of work on his hands but although i can't perfectly tame him till he goes on the nitka to school at least i can thoroughly shame him and make him appear like a fool slaves fetch me some eggs not new laid you can find some stale ones that will do now execute quick what i bade you or else i will execute you they brought him the eggs in a charger all studded with many a pearl the same pattern though just a bit larger as that of herodias girl and the caliph took one egg and hid it away in his cushion which done he bade them all do so they did it and sat down awaiting the fun with an air that was saucy and braggish with a step that was jaunty and spruce with a smile that was merry and waggish with a mien that was reckless and loose with a how is your high disposition to-morrow if god should so will with a here is our ancient position your majesty seeth us still with a face all be chalked and be painted with a bound through the portal doth pass one with whom we're already acquainted the world renowned abu nuwas right welcome right welcome my brother his majesty smilingly spake we were just now in want of another a nice game at forfeits to make whatever i do you must watch it and each do precisely the same if i catch you chaps laughing you'll catch it sit still and attend to the game if you do just as i do precisely a dinar a piece shall you gain if you don't won't i give it you nicely Monsieur, you stand by with the cane he spake and the smile on his features was mischievous cunning and grim and the courtiers poor awe-stricken creatures smiled feebly and gazed upon him cluck 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 a roo representing the note of a jubilant hen the caliph arises presenting an egg to the sight of all men cluck 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 a roo and the rabble are at once up on their legs and with ornithological gabble display their mysterious eggs then without in the least hesitating steps abu nuwas before all cock a doodle do do imitating a rooster's hilarious call now i know why it is that you cackle said he when you're trying to talk and you find me a hard one to tackle because i'm the cock of the walk End of section 7. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 8 of Humorous Readings and Recitations by Leopold Wagner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. 
Humorous Readings and Recitations, edited by Leopold Wagner. Chapter 8. A Journey in Search of Nothing, by Wilkie Collins. Yes, said the doctor, pressing the tips of his fingers with a tremulous firmness on my pulse, and looking straight forward into the pupils of my eyes. Yes, I see. The symptoms all point unmistakably towards one conclusion. Brain. My dear sir, you have been working too hard. You have been following the dangerous example of the rest of the world in this age of business and bustle. Your brain is overtaxed. That is your complaint. You must let it rest. There is your remedy. You mean, said I, that I must keep quiet and do nothing? Precisely so, replied the doctor. You must not read or write. You must abstain from allowing yourself to be excited by society. You must have no annoyances. You must feel no anxieties. You must not think. You must be neither elated nor depressed. You must keep early hours and take an occasional tonic, with moderate exercise, and a nourishing, but not too full, a diet. Above all, a perfect repose is essential to your restoration. You must go away into the country, taking any direction you please, and living just as you like, as long as you are quiet, and as long as you do nothing. I presume he is not to go away into the country without me, said my wife, who was present at the interview. Certainly not, rejoined the doctor, with an acquiescent bow. I look to your influence, my dear madam, to encourage our patient in following my directions. It is unnecessary to repeat them. They are so extremely simple and easy to carry out. I will answer for your husband's recovery if he will but remember that he has now only two objects in life, to keep quiet and to do nothing. My wife is a woman of business habits. As soon as the doctor had taken his leave, she produced her pocket-book and made a brief abstract of his directions for our future guidance. I looked over her shoulder and observed that the entry ran thus. Rules for dear William's restoration to health. No reading, no writing, no excitement, no annoyance, no anxiety, no thinking, tonic, no elation of spirits, nice dinners, no depression of spirits. Dear William, to take little walks with me, to go to bed early, to get up early, N.B. Keep him quiet. Mem. Mind he does nothing. Mind I do nothing? No need to mind that. I have not had a holiday since I was a boy. Oh, blessed idleness, after the years of merciless industry that have separated us, are you and I to be brought together again at last? Oh, my weary right hand, are you really to ache no longer with driving the ceaseless pen? May I indeed put you in my pocket and let you rest there indolently for hours together? Yes, for I am now at last to begin doing nothing. Delightful task that performs itself. Welcome responsibility that carries its weight away smoothly on its own shoulders. These thoughts shine in pleasantly on my mind after the doctor has taken his departure, and diffuse an easy gaiety over my spirits when my wife and I set forth the next day for the journey. We are not going the round of the noisy watering places, nor is it our intention to accept any invitations to join the circles assembled by festive country friends. My wife, 
guided solely by the abstract of the doctor's directions in her pocket-book, has decided that the only way to keep me absolutely quiet and to make sure of my doing nothing is to take me to some pretty retired village and to put me up at a little primitive unsophisticated country inn i offer no objection to this project not because i have no will of my own and am not master of all my movements but only because i happen to agree with my wife considering what a very independent man i am naturally it has sometimes struck me as a rather remarkable circumstance that i always do agree with her we find the pretty retired village a charming little place full of thatched cottages with creepers at the doors like the first easy lessons in drawing masters copybooks we find the unsophisticated inn just the sort of house that the novelists are so fond of writing about with the snowy curtains and the sheets perfumed by lavender and the matronly landlady and the amusing signpost this elysium is called the nag's head can the nag's head accommodate us yes with a delightful bedroom and a sweet parlour my wife takes off her bonnet and makes herself at home directly she nods her head at me with a look of triumph yes dear on this occasion also i quite agree with you here we have found perfect quiet here we may make sure of obeying the doctor's orders here we have at last discovered nothing nothing did i say nothing we arrive at the nag's head late in the evening have our tea go to bed tired with our journey sleep delightfully till about three o'clock in the morning and at that hour begin to discover that there are actually noises even in this remote country seclusion they keep fowls at the nag's head and at three o'clock the cock begins to crow and the hen to cluck under our window pastoral my dear and suggestive of eggs for breakfast whose reputation is above suspicion but i wish these cheerful fowls did not wake quite so early are there likewise dogs love at the nag's head and are they trying to bark down the crowing and clucking of the cheerful fowls i should wish to guard myself against the possibility of making a mistake but i think i hear three dogs a shrill dog who barks rapidly a melancholy dog who howls monotonously and a horse dog who emits barks at intervals like minute guns is this going on long apparently it is my dear if you will refer to your pocket-book i think you will find that the doctor recommended early hours we will not be fretful and complain of having our morning sleep disturbed we will be contented and we will only say that it is time to get up breakfast delicious meal let us linger over it as long as we can let us linger if possible till the drowsy midday tranquillity begins to sink over this secluded village strange but now i think of it again do i or do i not hear an incessant hammering over the way no manufacture is being carried on in this peaceful place no new houses are being built and yet there is such a hammering that if i shut my eyes i can almost fancy myself in the neighbourhood of a dockyard wagons too why does a wagon which makes so little noise in london make so much noise here is the dust on the road detonating powder that goes off with a report at every turn of the heavy wheels 
does the wagoner crack his whip or fire a pistol to encourage his horses children next only five of them and they have not been able to settle for the last half hour what game they shall play at on two points alone do they appear to be unanimous they are all agreed on making a noise and on stopping to make it under our window i think i am in some danger of forgetting one of the doctor's directions i rather fancy i am actually allowing myself to be annoyed let us take a turn in the garden at the back of the house dogs again the yard is on one side of the garden every time our walk takes us near it the shrill dog barks and the hoarse dog growls the doctor tells me to have no anxieties i am suffering devouring anxieties these dogs may break loose and fly at us for anything i know to the contrary at a moment's notice what shall i do give myself a drop of tonic or escape for a few hours from the perpetual noises of this retired spot by taking a drive my wife says take a drive i think i have already mentioned that i invariably agree with my wife the drive is successful in procuring us a little quiet my directions to the coachman are to take us where he pleases so long as he keeps away from secluded villages we suffer much jolting in by lanes and encourage a great variety of bad smells but a bad smell is a noiseless nuisance and i am ready to put up with it patiently towards dinner time we return to our inn meat vegetables pudding all excellently clean and perfectly cooked as good a dinner as ever i wished to eat shall i get a little nap after it the fowls the dogs the hammer the children the wagons are all quiet at last is there anything else left to make a noise yes there is the working population of the place it is getting on towards evening and the sons of labour are assembling on the benches placed outside the inn to drink what a delightful scene they would make of this homely everyday event on the stage how the simple creatures would clink their tin mugs and drink each other's healths and laugh joyously in chorus how the pleasant maidens would come tripping on the scene and lure the men tenderly to the dance where are the pipe and tabor that i have seen in so many pictures where the simple songs that i have read about in so many poems what do i hear as i listen prone on the sofa to the evening gathering of the rustic throng oaths nothing on my word of honour but oaths i look out and see gangs of cadaverous savages drinking gloomily from brown mugs and swearing at each other every time they open their lips never in any large town at home or abroad have i been exposed to such an incessant fire of unprintable words as now assail my ears in this primitive village no man can drink to another without swearing at him first no man can ask a question without adding a mark of interrogation at the end in the shape of an oath whether they quarrel which they do for the most part or whether they agree whether they talk of their troubles in this place or their good luck in that whether they are telling a story or proposing a toast or giving an order or finding fault with the beer these men seem to be positively incapable of speaking without an allowance of at least five foul words for every one fair word that issues from their lips english is reduced in their mouths to a brief vocabulary of all the vilest expressions in the language this 
is an age of civilization. This is a Christian country. Opposite me I see a building with a spire, which is called, I believe, a church. Past my window, not an hour since, there rattled a neat pony chaise with a gentleman inside, clad in glossy black broadcloth, and popularly known by the style and title of clergyman. And yet, under all these good influences, here sit twenty or thirty men whose ordinary table talk is so outrageously beastly and blasphemous that not a single sentence of it, though it lasted the whole evening, could be printed as a specimen for public inspection in these pages. When the intelligent foreigner comes to England, and when I tell him, as I am sure to do, that we are the most moral people in the universe, I will take good care that he does not set his foot in a secluded British village when the rural population is reposing over its mug of small beer after the labours of the day. I'm not a squeamish person, neither is my wife, but the social intercourse of the villagers drives us out of our room and sends us to take refuge at the back of the house. Do we gain anything by the change? None whatever. The back parlour to which we have now retreated looks out on a bowling green, and there are more benches, more mugs of beer, more foul-mouthed villagers on the bowling green. Immediately under our window is a bench and a table for two, and on it are seated a drunken old man and a drunken old woman. The aged sot in trousers is offering marriage to the aged sot in petticoats, with frightful oaths of endearment. Never before did I imagine that swearing could be twisted to the purposes of courtship. Never before did I suppose that a man could make an offer of his hand by bellowing imprecations on his eyes, or that all the powers of the infernal regions could be appropriately summoned to bear witness to the beating of a lover's heart under the influence of the tender passion. I know it now, and I derive little satisfaction from gaining the knowledge of it. The ostler is lounging about the bowling green, scratching his bare brawny arms and yawning grimly in the mellow evening sunlight. I beckon to him and ask him at what time the tap closes. He tells me at eleven o'clock. It is hardly necessary to say that we put off going to bed until that time, when we retire for the night drenched from head to foot, if I may so speak, in floods of bad language. I cautiously put my head out of the window and see that the lights of the taproom are really extinguished at the appointed time. I hear the drinkers oozing out grossly into the pure freshness of the summer night. They all growl together. They all go together. All? Sinner and sufferer that I am, I have been premature in arriving at that happy conclusion. Six choice spirits with a social horror in their souls of going home to bed prop themselves against the wall of the inn and continue the evening's conversazione in the darkness. I hear them cursing at each other by name. We have Tom, Dick and Sam, Jem, Bill and Bob to enliven us under our window after we are in bed. They begin improving each other's minds, as a matter of course, by quarrelling. Music follows and soothes the strife in the shape of a local duet sung by voices of vast compass, which soar in one note from howling bass to cracked treble. Yawning follows the duet, long, loud, weary yawning of all the company in chorus. This amusement over, Tom asks Dick for backer, and Dick denies that he has got any, and Tom tells him he lies, and Sam strikes in and says, No, he don't, and Jem tells Sam he lies, and Bill tells him that if he was Sam he would punch Jem's head, and Bob, apparently snuffing the battle afar off and not liking the scent of it, shouts suddenly a Pacific, Good night, in the distance. 
the farewell salutation seems to quiet the gathering storm they all roar responsive to the good night of bob next a song in chorus from bob's five friends outraged by this time beyond all endurance i spring out of bed and seize the water jug i pause before i empty the water on the heads of the assembly beneath i pause and hear oh most melodious most welcome of sounds the sudden fall of rain the merciful sky has anticipated me the clerk of the weather has been struck by my idea of dispersing the nag's head nightclub by water by the time i have put down the jug and got back to bed silence primeval silence the first the foremost of all earthly influences falls sweetly over our tavern at last that night before sinking wearily to rest i have once more the satisfaction of agreeing with my wife dear and admirable woman she proposes to leave this secluded village the first thing tomorrow morning never did i share her opinion more cordially than i share it now instead of keeping myself composed i have been living in a region of perpetual disturbance and as for doing nothing my mind has been so agitated and perturbed that i have not even had time to think about it we will go love as you so sensibly suggest we will go the first thing in the morning to any place you like so long as it is large enough to swallow up small sounds where over all the surface of this noisy earth the blessing of tranquillity may be found i know not but this i do know a secluded english village is the very last place towards which any man should think of turning his steps if the main object of his walk through life is to discover quiet end of chapter eight Section 9 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 9 gemini and virgo by c s calvary some vast amount of years ago ere all my youth had vanished from me a boy it was my lot to know whom his familiar friends called tommy i loved to gaze upon a child a young bud bursting into blossom artless as eve yet unbeguiled and agile as a young opossum and such was he, a calm-browed lad, yet mad at moments as a hatter. Why hatters as a race are mad, I never knew, nor does it matter. He was what nurses call a limb, one of those small misguided creatures, who, though their intellects are dim, are one too many for their teachers. And if you asked of him to say, what twice ten was or three times seven he'd glance in quite a placid way from heaven to earth from earth to heaven and smile and look politely round to catch a casual suggestion but make no effort to propound any solution of the question and not so much esteemed was he of the authorities and therefore he fraternized by chance with me needing a somebody to care for and three fair summers did we twain live as they say and love together and bore by turns the wholesome cane till our young skins became as leather and carved our names on every desk 
and tore our clothes and inked our collars and looked unique and picturesque but not it may be model scholars we did much as we chose to do we'd never heard of mrs grundy all the theology we knew was that we mightn't play on sunday and all the general truths that cakes were to be bought at half a penny and that excruciating aches resulted if we ate too many and seeing ignorance is bliss and wisdom consequently folly the obvious result is this that our two lives were very jolly at last the separation came real love at this time was the fashion and by a horrid chance the same young thing was to us both a passion old poser snorted like a horse his feet were large his hands were pimply his manner when excited coarse but miss p was an angel simply she was a blushing gushing thing all more than all my fancy painted once when she helped me to a wing of goose i thought i should have fainted the people said that she was blue but i was green and loved her dearly she was approaching thirty-two and i was then eleven nearly i did not love as others do none ever did that i've heard tell of my passion was a byword though the town she was of course the belle of oh sweet as to the toil-worn man the far-off sound of rippling river as to cadets in hindostan the fleeting remnant of their liver to me was anna dear as gold that fills the miser's sunless coffers as to the spinster growing old the thought the dream that she had offers i'd sent her little gifts of fruit i'd written lines to her as venus i'd sworn unflinchingly to shoot the man who dared to come between us and it was you my thomas you the friend in whom my soul confided who dared to gaze on to do i may say much the same as i did one night i saw him squeeze her hand there was no doubt about the matter i said he must resign or stand my vengeance as he chose the latter we met we planted blows on blows we fought as long as we were able my rival had a bottle nose and both my speaking eyes were sable when the school bell cut short our strife miss p gave both of us a plaster and in a week became the wife of horace nibbs the writing master i loved her then i love her still only one must not love another's but though and i my tommy will when we again meet meet as brothers it may be that in age one seeks peace only that the blood is brisker in boys veins than in theirs whose cheeks are partially obscured by whisker or that the growing ages steal the memories of past wrongs from us but this is certain that i feel most friendly unto thee o thomas and whatsoe'er we meet again on this or that side the equator if i've not turned teetotaler then and have wherewith to pay the waiter to thee i'll drain the modest cup ignite with thee the mild havana and we shall waft while liquoring up forgiveness to the heartless anna End of section 9. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.